to accept uh, to perform a nice presentation, a nice tutorial of, on neutrons and polymers and to see what kind of information neutrons can give us as a polymer scientist. So you have one hour maximum. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Etienne. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's my first time uh, on YouTube, so I hope I will give you uh, a nice tutorial. I don't know yet. Uh, the, the idea was to give an introduction to neutron science applied to polymers. And I, I hope you'll be convinced that uh, neutron scattering is really a, a tool that has been uh, for a long time very useful for polymer science. So uh, first, I show you the, the outline of my, of my talk. I will start with uh, some history. This is the history of science I, I like very much. And I will present, uh, I will tell you why the history of neutron science has been linked to polymer from the very beginning, I would say. I'll tell you more how you, you make neutron scattering experiment. I will tell you about the facilities that we have in Europe or in the world. And, um, and then I'll introduce the, 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 the fundamentals of, about the neutron scattering. And, uh, and uh, this lecture will be mostly based on examples. And I, I will take those examples from the research in our group. So the, our group is polymer self-assembly and lab science. So you will see that many of the polymers uh, we developed in the group are either um, biocompatible or biomimic polymers, but they, they follow the, the laws of polymer physics. And I will start different geometries uh, starting from the chains in solution, the polymer micelles, polymer vesicles, and I end up uh, with uh, three-dimensional matrices, especially hydrogens, so which are hydrophilic networks. Uh, unfortunately, I have only one hour, so I think I, I will keep for other webinars, or maybe Etienne can invite other colleagues to present other, uh, other parts which could be also polymers on surfaces, uh, like the, the block copolymer films or polymer brushes that can also be studied by neutron science, in particular by, by neutron reflectometry. And also I talk about dynamics in the title. I will sh show very little about dynamics, and, but uh, neutron can also be used to study the, the motions of the polymer chains, their diffusions. So let's try start first with a bit of history. So this slide is in French, but because it's from the uh, French Neutron Society, the, the neutron they were uh, discovered uh, by uh, Shadwick in the Cavendish lab in the UK. And uh, it was at the beginning of the modern physics uh, where you have all the uh, quantum mechanics and the uh, the Marie Curie um, daughter, Irene and Frédéric Joliot, uh, as soon as the neutron was uh, discovered by Shadwick, they use it. And they, this is why they got the Nobel Prize in 1935, because using the neutrons, they could create artificial radioactivity. So as you know, the neutron is an elementary particle that uh, if you bombard some nuclei like uranium, you can uh, start a nuclear reaction. And, and the first nuclear reaction uh, was done by in the, in the US by Enrico Fermi with uranium. And it was the, the beginning of what was called the Manhattan Project in the US, where the Americans, they ended up um, with the, the atomic bomb. And uh, right after the, the war, of course, the, we could find uh, another use of the neutron reaction, which is to produce electricity. So in France, we have the uh, Center for, for Atomic Energy, CEA, that uh, built the first uh, um, atomic pile in France, in, uh, in Saclay. Um, 
So I will present the, 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 those uh, reactors afterwards. But first, a few words about the neutron particle itself. So it is uh, an elementary particle. Its mass is uh, about the same as a proton, but unlike the proton that is positively charged, the neutron, like his uh, name says, it's neutral. So the difference, it can penetrate the matter much more than uh, uh, charged particle like uh, electrons or, or protons. And another characteristic is it has a magnetic moment, which is this property can be very useful to study the magnetic matter. And I told you about the quantum mechanics. So you have this uh, De Broglie formula that relates the, the moment, which is the, the speed of the, the particles you see here the different velocity of the, of the neutron, and they correspond, using this De Broglie formula, they correspond to different wavelengths. So the wavelengths of neutrons can vary from a few tenths of angstroms to a, a, a fraction of, of angstroms, and it corresponds to different energies. You have very hot neutrons. Those are the most dangerous that occurs in the atomic bomb, but um, what we are dealing with in neutron scattering is what we call the thermal neutrons. They have, a, I would say, a mild energy. And um, so from this um, K vector, because the neutron is both a particle and a wave, um, when, you, when the neutron beam shine a sample, so what I call sample is um, a material that is made of immunogeneity, so I will tell you which kind of inhomogeneities are useful for neutron scattering. But then um, the neutron will be scattered at some angle, theta, and um, you will define the wave vector of the scattered beam. And if you make the difference um, of the scattered wave vector minus the incident wave vector, this is the scattering vector, Q. And then, you have two cases. Either the energy of uh, uh, the neutron is the same, so we speak about elastic scattering, and in that case, um, the the modulus of the k vector remains the same. So you can apply simple geometry to prove this relationship between the q vector and the angle theta, or you can have a difference of energy. So when the difference of energy is, uh, is not zero, we, we call that inelastic scattering. And th this inelastic scattering is interesting to study the dynamics. Here, I will present mostly elastic scattering where um, you don't have change of energy. Of course, you need to detect your, your neutron, so you use a detector, and the detector is made of many cells, and in each, each of these its cells, you have a gas. So usually it's a boron fluoride. And when uh, it captures a neutron, it will produce a current. So this is the principle of a detector. The detectors, they can be uh, one dimensional or two dimensional. They can be concentric rings. But OK, this sketch is um, the most simple view of, of the scattering experiment. So the, you see that the, the first experiments on neutron scattering on polymers are 50 years old, the be, at the beginning of the 70s. And uh, this, this is one of, this is maybe the first paper on neutron scattering on polymers by Jean-Pierre Coton, Bernard Farnou, and Gérard Janinck from the CA in Saclay. And um, at that time, the first experiment didn't work very much, but until they realized that to, to measure a signal, like on those curves, you need a deuterated solvent. It's written here. So they use deuterated benzene at that time. Um, and then using different polystyrene um, in the bulk. So they, 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 they vary the concentration. And they had those curves. They could fit them with, by a Lorentzian law with a, a parameter uh, xi. 
And uh, this was, uh, I tried to show, yes, yes. On this figure, they plot the Xi value versus the concentration. And this Xi value, it's the correlation length of uh, concentrated solution of polymers. So at the same time, the beginning of the 70s, you had the, the, it was the beginning of the physics of polymers where the concept of uh, semi-dilute solution were introduced. And this is why uh, the, those pioneers, um, they, uh, they worked also with uh, Mohamed Daoud, who was a theoretician. Uh, and it was interesting because in their papers, they made a parallel between magnetism. Uh, Pierre-Gilles Degene, whose name is here, he made his thesis on uh, neutron scattering for magnetic uh, materials and uh, superconductors. And here you see in those old papers, they make a so-called easing model to model polymers. So that was, and, and Pierre-Gilles de Gênes was well known to um, use the concept of uh, solid state chemistry, uh, solid state physics and magnetism uh, in polymer science. Uh, so you see, they made also a nature paper. Um, the, the group was called Strasacol. So why? Because it's the contraction of Strasbourg, Saclay, and Collège de France. So Saclay, it's for the experiment, or especially for the deterioration of the polymers. But here you see the polystyrene deteriorated. The monomers were produced in Saclay, but the polymerization was made in Strasbourg at the Institute Charles Sadron, uh, who is also very well known in polymer science. And um, in this paper with Henri Benoit, um, they studied uh, polystyrene in either in solution or in the, the, in the melt, in the bulk. And uh, they, because they had different uh, molecular mass of polystyrene, they could plot the scaling law of uh, the radius of generation versus the mass. And they found the famous uh, exponent of 0 0.6, which is called the Flory exp uh, exponent in a good solvent, or um, the low be become 0 0.5 uh, in the melt or in a theta solvent. So you see that the neutron uh, unable to, um, to verify the, the the fundamental laws of polymer physics. So here I show you how were those experiments. Uh, this is, I mean, one of the first reactor in France. Actually, this is the third. It's called EL3. EL means eau lourde, uh, heavy water that was used as moderator. And um, uh, in Saclay, then later on, there were other reactors were built. Uh, like Osiris here and Orphe. Uh, Osiris was used to produce ra radionuclide and Orphe um, was built in the 80s uh, for, the, for the scientists. And this EL3 was located somewhere here. You, you can still see uh, the, the building when you go to Saclay. And here you see those, all those fields now, there, this is where the University Paris-Saclay is located now. But at, at, the, at this time, there were only fields. Here you have pictures of the, uh, the uh, guide hall in uh, Saclay. Uh, this is the reactor. That we, we, it was possible to visit it uh, until uh, recent years. And uh, so the old guide, the nuclear reactor is around here, this orange part, and you see the different beam lines. So the neutrons are guided by some mirrors made of nickel, and then you have the experiments. So here you, you see the gentleman with more hair and less gray hair, and a more recent picture uh, with, with the students. The, this experiment here is Passé, and this one is Paxi. Uh, those are um, small angle uh, diffractometer 
uh, I will present you the, the, the results of, of those experiments. Uh, in the 70s, so 50 years ago, uh, a big reactor was built in Grenoble. So um, it was called the high flux reactor. It's very powerful. And uh, you see the, this is the Grenoble uh, campus. Power off. Oh, I need. Uh, and on campus, you have a synchrotron here and the reactor ILL, Institute La Langevin. And this reactor is international. It was settled by the French and the German, and then they were followed also by the British and all those countries. So this is really a European and even more international center. Uh, it is a facility that can be uh, used by anyone in the world. Uh, I will explain you more. You need to apply for beam time. Here on this map, I show you the different source in, in Europe. Um, in Germany, they used to be several ones, like in Ulish, but now they, in Germany, they have still this one, MLZ, in Munich. Um, you, you have the ILL here in Grenoble. Unfortunately, the LLB was closed uh, at the end of 2019. And uh, one um, future source, very uh, important, is located here. It's called ESS. This one is not ready yet. It will be available maybe in 10 years. But um, this is a new type of neutron source. It's called a spallation source. In Europe, we have already uh, two spallation sources. We have ESIS in the uh, UK and PSI in Switzerland. So those sources are different. They are not reactors. They are accelerators um, that um, can produce the neutron. And unlike a nuclear reactor, if you switch off the electricity and the accelerator, then the, the beam is stopped. So it's believed to be a safer way to produce neutron. In the US also, they have a spallation source. Um, in America, you have one source in Canada, and in the US, you have several ones. The two, the, the two principal are uh, the NIST in Gaithersburg, and Oak Ridge National Lab. You have also source in, in Russia, in Australia, in Korea. So you see that all over the world, you have neutron source. But it's true that there is a general trend to replace the, um, the big facilities. Like, for example, in France, we had to close Orphe. But maybe in future, uh, small, smaller campus will develop their own source, so it's called Compact Accelerator Neutron Source. They are already in US, Argentina, Japan, and in France there are at least one project to, to, to build a new type of source like that. So now, how does it work? Um, you need to apply, uh, uh, when you want to use neutron scattering, you need to apply for beam time. So you write a proposal on your, uh, on your subject and uh, twice a year, there is a committee. For example, the largest one is at ILL. You have uh, several subcommittees, for example, uh, in, uh, in biology, in soft condensed matter. And uh, if your proposal passes this committee, then you get allocated beam time. So usually the minimum is one day and you can have two or three days maybe more for certain experiments. So here I present at ILL the, the, the small angle neutron scattering spectrometer. So the oldest one is D11. I mean, the, the first experiment I show you in the 70s, they were made on D11. Uh, the current local contact I, are Leonardo and Ralph. Uh, this experiment, is not only one of the oldest, it's also one of the longest. You see this big tank here. This is where is the detector. The detector can move in the tank. It is under, under vacuum. And the, the longer 
the, the distance from the sample to the detector, the smaller angle you can reach. And the small angle means a very low Q vector. The first part of the experiment, okay, you have the neutron coming from the reactor. And here you see velocity selector. As I told you, the neutron is both a particle and a, a wave. So using De Broglie um, momentum, you can select the, the, the wavelength of the neutron by selecting the speed. So you have those selectors that are kind of a shopper that can select the neutron with the um, appropriate speed, meaning the appropriate wavelength. Another spectrometer is D22, so it's a bit smaller, but um, the characteristic of that one is that it's very versatile. You have a lot of experiments that can be combined with the neutron scattering. So usually in every spectrometer, you can apply uh, temperature, either low temperature or high temperature, or you can apply pressure or magnetic field. But on, this on D22, you have a lot of other techniques. You can do time resolved neutron scattering, so using a stop flow. You can do rheology. So rheology was implemented by Lionel Porcar here. Uh, you can also make GPC, so which is very interesting for polymers. So it's Anne Martel who um, made the coupling of GPC with SANS. Or uh, you can do spectroscopy. Uh, even you can have a microfluidic. Uh, it's Joao Cabral from, uh, from London who brought this technology here. And also you can have dynamic light scattering. So this is a company, Cordon Technology, located uh, in near Bordeaux that um, implemented the in-situ dynamic light scattering. So you can follow your particles by DLS while you measure them by SANS. Recently, also Tobias Unruh from Erlangen in Germany, he brought a SACS apparatus. So this is really the, the, the first time uh, you can, can do simultaneously X-ray and neutron on the same sample. And uh, this dialysis cell, so this is the experiment we were doing. It was built uh, by Christophe Schatz here, and uh, Lionel, and Jean-Paul Chapelle. And th this dialysis cell can follow, uh, it enable to um, follow the self-assembly of polymers when you dialyze um, the, the solvent. Uh, I, now I just would like to just tell a few words about um, a former colleague at ILL that uh, unfortunately has passed away. So I will take just one minute to recall the memory of Isabel Griot because Isabel Griot was local contact at ILL. Uh, she was involved also in D33, which is a third sans spectrometer. And Isabel was really a very good scientist and uh, a very kind local contact. She introduced, for example, the stop flow on D22. She, and she, she studied the um, polymers um, to carry perfumes. She also, she, she was the one who was the first to study the, um, the Ouzo effect. And it was really a shock last summer to learn that she passed away, she had a, a disease that nobody knows, but uh, the, there will be a conference. So the, the conference was supposed to, to take place in March, but due to the COVID-19 crisis, it has been postponed. So really, I encourage you to attend when we know the date to this seminar uh, that will gather all the uh, French uh, community of, of salt matter and neutron science. And later on, I will tell you uh, an idea that Isabel uh, gave us uh, while we were making measurements in, uh, in Grenoble. So how do you learn the, the neutron, practically the neutron? So this web page here, it's almost 20 years old, but th this was the announcement for um, a tutorial called FANS, Formation à la Diffusion Neutronique. So every year, the LLB 
Laboratoire Lyon Briouin organized this uh, tutorial, so with practical class, until uh, last year, until the closure of the uh, of the Orphe reactor. And uh, now, in 2020, um, the French Federation in, in Neutron Science um, will uh, follow up with the French uh, Neutron Society to um, to train young people because um, because ESS will be available only uh, in something like 10 years. So we need to continue to train the young generation. Um, another training is called Hercule. It is uh, about X-ray and neutron and in Grenoble. But um, so I encourage those who want to practice neutron science to, to, to check the, the website of uh, the French uh, Federation of Neutron to, to see when this training will be organized. So now let's come back uh, to the fundamentals. Um, so where does the, the contrast come from? Maybe some of you know the X-ray. In X-ray, the contrast comes from the electrons of the atoms. So we define the scattering lens. So each atom has a scattering cross-section and the sigma, and you can define the, the, the scattering lens. And you see that for the X-ray, it's simple because the more electrons in the atoms, the larger the scattering lens. For neutron, it's different. For the, the neutron, it's something that has to do with the nuclei. So you see the scattering lens, it's very small dimension. It's not the dimension of the atom, it's the dimension of the nucleus. And you see that you have some nuclei, like the deuterium, which have a very high scattering lens. And on the contrary, the hydrogen is not only smaller, but it also is opposite sign. So when you want to, to calculate the contrast in a neutron scattering experiment, you calculate the scattering lens density. So you, you make the sum of the, the BI values for all the atoms in the molecule. So I take here the examples for polystyrene. So first for normal polystyrene, hydro, hydrogenated polystyrene or deuterated polystyrene. So you make the sum of the, the, the B values and you divide by the volume of the molecule that can be calculated from the molar mass and the density. Um, you need to know also that when you deuterate a molecule like uh, polystyrene, you don't change the volume of the molecule because the volume of the molecule is mostly determined by the electrons. But if you change the, uh, the number, if you replace um, hydrogen by deuterium, you, you won't change the, the volume of the molecule. Um, so here we calculate for uh, polystyrene hydrogenated. And you see that at the beginning, if you measure in um, hydrogenated solvent, you have almost the same scattering lens density. So if you want to do a scattering experiment, you need to be in a deuterated solvent, like deuterated THF or benzene, and then you have a large contrast. Or if possible, you can deuterate the polymers. And in, that, in this case, you can use uh, hydrogenated solvent or CS2 that was used uh, at the early times. So this is for the contrast. Then, um, okay, I'm sorry, there is a bit of theory, but this is the scattering. In scattering, um, your object becomes like a source, every point of the object. So you can make the, the sum of all the, um, the wavelengths from the object. And you have this kind of integrals. And uh, if you read the textbook, you see that you can, um, write the intensity, it's always a product of the contrast. So we already spoke about the contrast. So the volume fraction of the material one in a second material that can be the solvent. And all this integral, it is called the form factor. 
So if you don't want to do the math, you can take in the literature um, the theoretical formula for the form factor, or you can even use the software, SASView, to fit your data. And another property that I need to mention is called the scattering invariant. So when you do this, uh, the, the integral of Q, Q squared times intensity, you can get an experimental value of the contrast if you know the volume fraction. So this, this is relationship that is very useful in a small angle scattering. So let's come from, let's uh, talk about the polymer chains. Um, we take the most simple model, which is the Gaussian chain. As you know, it's a random walk. And um, Flory described uh, that in, in, the, in the 60s. Um, you can define the radius of gyration that is related to the center of mass. And um, it is a particular type of, uh, of particle. And if you use the, the, the sim this formula for the intensity where you have the volume fraction that's related to molar mass density, you have the contrast and you have the form factor. And the form factor was derived long ago by Paul Debye in this 1947 paper with this formula. So here, uh, Rg is the radius of gyration. You also, in a small angle, you also have Rg for Guigné, which who is a famous scientist, but I will show you, there is no difference. Radius of gyration or, or Guigné is about the same. So now I come to the example. I will take the example from the, the research in our group. So as you know, the group um, aims at studying uh, uh, polymers that are biomimetic. So Sebastian, and Elizabeth, they produce recombinant protein whose name is ELP, elastin like peptide, also with the help of uh, uh, Bertrand Gerbay, who can produce the plasmid to make those uh, proteins. So they are really proteins. And the, the, the sequence, there are repetition of this sequence, ZPGXG. X is an amino acid that can be anything except proline. So proline is this amino acid here that makes a kind of kink. So we, what we show is that those uh, proteins, they really behave like polymers. So how do we see that? Uh, Elizabeth was able to produce dye block ELPs where there are two blocks. Uh, one has a, a guest residue that is valine, so hydrophobic amino acid, and another block where the guest residue is more hydrophilic. So above a certain temperature, the micellar uh, transition temperature, you can make nanoparticles. So here you see the, the block length. So we, we keep the hydrophilic block constant is a, a degree of polymerization of 60, and we vary the, the, the size of the hydrophobic uh, block. And you see that the transition temperature decreased. So Elizabeth, she did the uh, first uh, light scattering in the lab, and she measured the radius, uh, something like 40 nanometer, with a very low polydispersity. So it seems that those dye block ELP, they can form uh, very well uh, structured micelles, but uh, and also the, the light scattering give you another information is you see the scattered light that increase as a function of temperature, even above the CMT. So it was kind of puzzle. And uh, so this is why we went to the neutron to understand this puzzle. So we went to the LLB. And first, we did the experiment with Annie Brulé, who is our local contact there. At, uh, at low temperature. At low temperature, the dye block ELP is soluble. So we, we used this Debye uh, function that we just learned about, and we measured the radius of gyration as a function of the mass. And here you really see it follows a scaling law of exponent around 0 0.5. So 
pretty much like random calls or polymers in theta solvent. Um, there, there is a subtlety that I just need to explain you. Uh, Bertrand and Gauvin, who are doing his thesis with Elizabeth and myself, he realized that the, the die block ELP, uh, which this is the sequence, and at the end, there is a cysteine here. The cysteine it has a SH function that can make dimers. So here, the dimers you see on the, the gel here, it tells that in, in, the, in this formula I showed you, there was a mistake because the molar, the molar mass that we use actually was uh, two times lower because they were dimers. You can, you can reduce the dimers with some reducing agent. So if you recalculate the right prefactor here and you extrapolate to one monomer, so the monomer is this pentapeptide, VPG, VG, with a molar mass around 400, you find 7.5 angstrom. And this is about the size that you imagine for the, the, the monomer unit. Because you, you see the proline here. So this is the C terminus here, and the NH2 is here. And you see there is kind of kink. So this molecule is rather compact and so the, you can have something like 15 angstrom for, for the, the pentapeptide. So we were happy with, with scaling law. And now I take another uh, example. So this example uh, I take from another team at LCPO, so the polymer for green materials. Uh, Hélène Mehreux did her thesis with Henri Kramag and Etienne. And in, the, in their group, they work on biosource polymers, especially on estolide, which are ramified polyesters of hydroxy fatty acid. Um, so I, I won't give you the formulas because uh, I think it's still unpublished and it will stop me. <laughs> but just to tell you that it, those, those polymers, they are based on ricinoleic acid or uh, hydroxy stearate. So they are uh, polyesters and they have the characteristic to be um, ramified. And so Hélène, she measured precisely um, their, their molar, molar mass by GPC, uh, the density of the polymers, and she, she compared different solvents. Um, toluene, that is a good solvent, and dodecan, that is a bad solvent. And um, she measured the specific uh, intrinsic viscosity. Uh, this is the way the, the polymer changed the viscosity of the solvent. And um, as you may know, it is directly related to the radius of gyration. So in this study, uh, you see here the fit, where you have the radius of gyration of the chain. And um, so the, the science, the, the interest of neutron scattering for this study was to, to confirm the, uh, the idea that those uh, polymers, uh, when you vary temperature, um, they could either swell or, or decrease the, their size. And why is it in, important for application is because, as you know, uh, when you have the oil and you heat up the oil, it, it gets less and less viscous, and you want to use polymers as viscosity uh, modifier to, uh, to restore some vis uh, viscous effect at high temperature. So this, is, this was the idea. Okay, now I come back to the ELPs. Um, the ELPs, they, they are dye blocks, and above a certain temperature, they make the, the scattering curve is no more a uh, numeric chain, you have a very large scattering. And you see that kind of oscillation. So I will tell you more about the scattering by my cell. So if you have a sphere, the, the formula of the form factor that you can find in textbook uh, is, is this formula. You have certain oscillations. And when you do a neutron scattering experiment, when you see oscillation, the experimentalist is happy because you can get the, the size of the micelles uh, straight away. 
uh, you have this relationship here, QR equals 4.5. So this is the this is the fit of the curve, but you see here for, for the blue one, uh, you have like 100 angstrom uh, radius. And here, if you look here, the Q value is about 0 0.04. And so you can, without even doing the fit, you, you, you can have a, an estimate of the, of the radius of the mice cells. And also in the mice cells, the envelope of the curve is Q minus four. It's called the Porod regime. You remember, you remember for a chain, it was more Q square. Here it's Q four. So the, this example was, uh, this was the mice cells I just showed you the curve. Uh, they, they are made of uh, uh, a dye block made of trimethylene carbonate, so hydrophobic polymer, and a very hydrophilic peptide, which is called TATS. And um, here we use this uh, uh, scattering uh, invariant integral to calculate the experimental contrast. And the experimental contrast is always lower than the theoretical contrast. It is due to the hydration. So you can deduce the number of water molecules that are linked um, to the, the chains here. This is the, here the number of water molecules per micelle. And you can calculate also the number of aggregation, which is how many molecules in the micelles. And if you calculate the surface, you can have the surface of one molecule. And you see here that it's about 0 0.3 nanometer square. It is relatively constant. It is, um, the, the surface is dominated by the size of this pe that peptide because it is positively charged, repulsive, and so on. So now I come back to the dye block ELPs. So okay, we had a lot of, uh, of curves of different temperatures. And uh, here you see the different dye blocks. And um, from the, the contrast, we can estimate the volume fraction of water. So we, we know wh what is volume fraction of water in the mice cells. And by simple geometrical formula, we can get also the aggregation. So how many molecules of ELP in the mice cells? So this is the same data, but more um, on the curve. And uh, you have the different dye blocks. And um, um, we can renormalize all of them on the master curve. So the different uh, uh, block, block size. Uh, where, when we plot relatively to the transition temperature. And you see that you have a universal behavior that the radius of the mice cells is related to the radius of the chain with something like 1.5. And here, this is the volume fraction of water. And you see that it, it decreases after the CMT, so the, the micellar transition. And then you have identification. And here, if you plot versus the aggregation number, you have the scaling law. And we re realize that those micelles are not like the standard micelles that are called like the crew cut micelles. It's a name of a, for a model, but they are more like star-like. So we, we plot, we have this sketch where we have the uh, ELP dye block. Uh, they make a micelle, and, but there, there is still water in the core above the, the CMT. And when you heat up more, you, the water molecule get out of the core and uh, you have more the star-like uh, behavior. Actually, in the same issue as our paper, there was th this one by uh, Ekaterina Zulina and uh, Michael Rubinstein, who are famous theoreticians, and they, they uh, describe the uh, ELP micelles. They call it weak micelles. So it's a micelle that can be formed by, formed by a polymer uh, which has, which is in the regime with an exponent of 0 0.5. So usually if you have a polystyrene micelle, it's a, the, the core is totally collapsed. You have no more solvent in the core, but here with the weak micelles, you, you still have solvent. So that, that was the, the, the conclusion on that, on that work. What, what is new in this topic? 
uh, last year, Ye Shao defended his thesis in the group, and uh, Ye did something else. He did conjugate. So he conjugated the ELP with hydrophilic block. So for example, he used dextran, which is a well-known uh, hydrophilic polymer. He, he did a um, click chemistry to couple with the ELPs. And Ye did uh, DLS measurement in the lab. Well, in DLS, you, you, here you measure the transition temperature. Uh, this is not DLS, this is a turbidimetry. But you can define the cloud point here. And you see that it really follows the same law as uh, LCST polymer. So you have the cloud point that vary with concentration, and more especially with the logarithm of concentration. And um, so it really shows that the ELP behave like polymers. But OK, in DLS, you cannot, OK, it's interesting. You can see that you have aggregation and that depending on the, the ramp velocity, um, the, the intensity can be different. But you really need the neutron to tell more about the structure of the micelles. So we did the same as previously. Uh, we measured the ELP polysaccharide uh, at low temperature. And we could fit them with the Dubai and, and calculate the aggregation number. So to, to tell if the chains are unimers or if they are slightly aggregated. And what show the curves here is that um, the, the ELP here, so the pure ELP is not aggregated. But here you see that, for example, the dextran ELP has slight aggregates. And hyaluronic ELP also, also this, this hexaose ELP. And only the PEG ELP are totally uh, unimer chains. And but what happened when you heat up above the transition temperature? OK, the ELP, you have a high scattering at low Q. So it makes macroscopic fast separation. But with the dye block, like for example here, the hyaluronic acid ELP, you recognize the oscillations typical of sphere. So here are results for the different ELP copolymers with dextran, hyaluronic acid, laminary exos, and PEG. And um, you see that compared to the pure ELP, we can form micelles. So here on this table, you have the size of the micelles, the radius for the three dye blocks. And only with that one, because this one is, is, has only six um, glucose function, so it's very small. So it's, it's like the ELP. It does not make spheres. You have a large aggregate. So then we, had, we asked this question, what happens if we mix two types of dye blocks? Um, for example, uh, ELP based on dextran and ELP based on hyaluronic acid. Do we have mixing? So this is the case for the mixing of the ELP PEG and ELP dextran. And you see that you have quite a good mixture of the, of the two because Either you, you, you mix the two curves or you, the, you measure the scattering curve of the mixture, you, you find approximately the same. It is not the case for all of them. If you mix hyaluronic acid ELP and dextran ELP, you still have a good mixture. But if you mix ELP PEG and ELP hyaluronan, you see you don't have, you don't have a sphere, you have scattering, you, you have big clusters. So you see that depending on the nature, on the nature of the polysaccharide, um, you can have either a sphere that is made of the two type of chains, or you can have a um, big aggregate. So this is to summarize the study. The, the neutron can give you an idea of the structure at the scale below 20 nanometer, but it has to be combined with DLS that gives you the structure of the larger aggregate. 
look at the time. I have been a bit <laughs> already a bit long, uh, but I, I I want to do now a second part. If you are not too exhausted on the vesicles, because I, we start from chains, then we went to micelles, and then the next step is vesicles. So polymer vesicles, also called polymerosomes, they have a special signature in neutron scattering. You and neutron scattering enables to measure especially the, the, the thickness. And we, we study different uh, vesicles that are made by different molecules. So we call them hybrid, especially hybrid of lipids and polymers. And also one goal that is, uh, we are interested in is mixing nanoparticle and, and, uh, and polymer vesicles. So this was a review paper where we show the advantage of the polymer vesicles. Uh, compared to liposome, there, the polymer can be modified. Uh, you can incorporate nanoparticles. You can jellyfy inside the polymerosomes, and you can make those hybrid vesicles. I will tell you more afterwards, where you have uh, lipid in, tagged in red and polymer in green. Of course, here you see the image because it, they are called giant vesicles. But how do you make the, the nano vesicle? So we use this uh, nano precipitation technique that can be used with many polymers. So always uh, di block polymer like polystyrene PO, PLA PO, PCL PO, or, or polymers that have a hydrophobic block that has a low TG, uh, like PDMS, polybutadiene, and you you pour water in, in the solution and uh, above a certain fraction, the, you have the self-assembly of the broker polymers and hopefully you, you make the vesicles. But how are we sure that we have vesicles? So this is the typical signature of the vesicle in, in, uh, in science. So here I take the example of POPCL, polycaprolactone. If you have the right ratio of hydrophilic to hydrophobic block, you see the, the curve here. Um, it has the global behavior with a slope uh, near Q, Q minus two. And this is the theoretical form factor for a vesicle. So you can deduce it from, this is the form factor for my cell, but you can consider a vesicle like um, the subtraction of a small, small sphere inside the larger sphere. So a vesicle is basically a shell, a spherical shell. And if you fit this curve, uh, you can get the radius of the core and the membrane uh, thickness here, for example, D is the thickness. And especially you can uh, measure the, the thickness another way. Uh, you plot here uh, intensity multiplied by Q squared versus Q. And here you see it's almost flat. So, and here you have the departure from the plateau. And in this region here, you plot the logarithm of IQ square and you get, um, you get a line and, you, and the, the slope of the line gives you the, the thickness. For example, here, 21 nanometer. So here is an example. It, it was made by Coralie Lebleu in the group. She studied uh, two types of uh, block polymers, so either PTMC-PO or polybutadiene-PO. Uh, they both make vesicles, so you see the, the fitting of, of the curves. And uh, Coralie here, she reports in this table the, um, here the, the thickness of the membrane or, um, that is measured either by neutron or by cryo TM, and she plots the, the thickness versus the molecular, the molar mass of the, of the hydrophobic block, and you see a scaling law. So for PTMC, you have this exponent of 0 0.5. We have already discussed it, that is typical for, for melt. For polybutadiene, you see the exponent is larger. So it seems maybe because the polybutadiene the molar mass was lower. It's a regime where the chains are not in the, in the random coil regime, they are more in a stretch regime. So this is why even though 
the molar mass is small, the thickness is larger. And uh, this, one, this effect has already been described by Denis Discher, for example. So here, for the same kind of polymer zones, I show you that we can put nanoparticles, especially magnetic nanoparticles, inside the membrane. Um, so here we see the, the envelope with the, you know, the Q minus two and Q minus four. And um, when we, you apply a magnetic field, I will show, explain you more after. So here uh, in this PTMC peg, in this example, we use a PTMC with a very large degree of polymerization and they can fit the magnetic nanoparticles. So uh, the magnetic nanoparticles, they have a neutron SLG that is about the same as heavy water. So when you are in heavy water, the uh, magnetic nanoparticles are quite invisible. And you see that you look at the uh, curve for the polymer contrast, and you always find a curve typical of, of vesicles. So it tells us that when you incorporate magnetic nanoparticles in the membrane, you keep the vesicular structure. And this is very important because what we are interested at is to apply a magnetic field and here, this was done on the Paxi spectrometer, which has a 2D detector. We can measure the anisotropy of the scattering. And we can deduce from the anisotropy of scattering, we can deduce, we have an ID, we can have an ID of the deformation of the magnetic vesicles. So this is something we are currently studying uh, with a new PhD student uh, to make uh, anisotropic magnetic vesicles. Uh, I'm a bit late, but I'd like to present this other work on hybrid vesicles. So hybrid vesicles, uh, they have been introduced by my, my colleague Jean-Francois Lemins and uh, Halid Fergi, who is listening. He was postdoc in the group. And um, the, the idea is to mix the, in the same vesicles lipids and polymers. But of course, as you know, the lipid bilayer are very small. They make only three or four nanometers, whereas the dye block polymer membrane are much thicker. So how can they mix together in the same vesicle? Um, depending on, on difference of size between the lipid and the, and, and the polymer, you can imagine two cases. Either you have a fast separation with pure lipid uh, domain, and polymer, or you can have a mixing. So there were two PhD students working in, the, in this area, uh, Tuyen, Dao, and Martin. And uh, I will show you some of their work. So here are the polymers that were synthesized by Tuyen and later by Martin. So they are based on PDMS and PO. PDMS is very soft polymer, and this one here, this graft polymer is commercial. You can buy it from the Doe company. It's a graft polymer. And in the group, the, the colleague, they synthesize tri-block of different uh, PDMS block lengths corresponding to different thickness of the membrane. And in this case, the, the scaling law has also an exponent uh, that is more 0 0.6 than 0 0.5. Okay, and um, the, the great advantage of uh, SANS is that you can vary the contrast. So either you, you will use uh, hydrogenated solvent, and in, in this case, you match the polymer. So what you will see here is mostly due to the scattering of the lipid. Or you will use a mixture of heavy water and light water that is more uh, near the, the pure heavy water, and then you hide, you match the contrast of the lipid, and you, you will see the polymer. So this kind of experiment, they were done with pure liposomes in the US by John Katsaras. Uh, John Katsaras, he used a trick of uh, um, complete matching of the average. So he used a solvent that completely match 
the composition of the lipids. And he was using a mixture of um, lipid that is uh, in the fluid phase and lipid in the gel phase. So at the beginning, you have zero contrast. And when the, um, the, the gel uh, phase forming lipids uh, separate, then you see the contrast. So this, this was the idea that Chan Katsa has performed. So in, in our case, we did it a bit differently. We, we used the derated lipids and the hydrogenated polymers. And um, um, depending on the contrast, we could um, model the scattering curve with disks because we, we, our model, so we call that a poor man's model, this very simple one. We have domains in the vesicles that are like disks. So this is the form factor for disk with the, the best cell function. So again, it's pure mass. But, um, and uh, later on, we try to make a more complicated model. So this is where El uh, Isabel Griot helped us. Because Isabel, she told us about the paper that studied vesicles which were holy, so which had hole in them. And so we decided to do the same to build a composite form factor where we have the form factor of uh, a shell, so in green, and uh, we subtract the form factor of a polymer disk and we add the form factor of lipid disk. So we, we do some, this kind of composite form factor. And uh, in the case, so here it is with the, the, the graft polymer or the dye block polymer. Um, here, what was interesting is that even though we are looking at the polymer, we see an effect of, of temperature. So it proved that we have the lipid in the, in the membrane and it, the lipid changes yeah, it has a, a melting temperature. So you see that the lipid transfer its thermosensitivity to the polymer. We were helped by the colleagues uh, in Portugal. They're doing the, the FRET. So what is the FRET? Is the, the transfer of fluorescence between the, the green fluorescent dye that is linked to the polymer and the red fluorescent dye, which is rhodamine in the lipid. And um, also, we were helped by the colleagues in Strasbourg that could image such kind of faceted vesicles where you, on the same vesicle, you have portion with a thick membrane here and a portion of the thin membrane. So we think that this thin portion are the nano disks that we model with the neutron and the rest of the vesicle is made of polymers and here of lipids. So this is more or less that we obtain with the with our hybrid uh, form factor. We could estimate the the number of nano disks in in the vesicle. And uh, here for the for the graft polymer, this is where we found the largest nano disk in, in this case, seven nanometer. Okay. Um, to conclude on the hybrid vesicles, I will show you, um, this is the only slide that I have about the dynamic properties. I told you that the neutron can uh, also measure dynamic properties. Um, there are several ways to, to, to measure dynamic properties. So we, the, for example, we can use FRAP, which is uh, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. It can give us the diffusion constant of the molecule in the membrane. So you do that on giant vesicles. You can do um, NMR, NMR profile. So this is what we did in collaboration with Dermot Brugham, Horacaron in Dublin. And we, we just did one attempt um, of neutron spin echo at, uh, in Sake where you can uh, also access to dynamic of the membrane from the, um, from the structure factor that varies as a function of time using the so-called Zinman granite. Unfortunately, the experiment in Saclay, um, here you see the time scale. We, we, we start to have signal at long time scale 
so above the nanosecond, but it's not available at least when we did only one attempt. And uh, so this is this was just a preliminary experiment, but in theory, from this type of uh, neutron spin echo, you can access to um, this bending modulus here, here this this kappa that was also modeled for the NMR study. So I, I don't tell you much about dynamics. I think it would be worth doing a, a whole uh, lecture on dynamics. I'm not the most uh, uh, expert person in, in that, but uh, you just need to know that you can also study the dynamics of polymer chains, not only the not only the, 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 the structure. So the conclusion uh, for these uh, hybrid vesicles is that um, okay? You can make hybrid uh, small unilaminar vesicles, and um, you can have difference between uh, block copolymers and graft copolymers. Uh, recently, Martin has also synthesized uh, die block, not only tri block, and has a new result in, in this area. So now I've been like one hour long, so I think I, I was too long. <laughs> So I, I won't present, I think, Etienne, oops. Uh, oops, Etienne, what do you think? No, I, 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 I think it's okay if we, if we stop here. I, I guess there is no, some question. Oh. I guess there will be some question because, okay, it's already one hour long. Yeah, it's, it's already too long, Etienne, so I need to, yeah. to stop. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid about uh, how many more slides you have. No, no, but I, I had more slides, but it was uh, about the hydrogen. Uh, I, I go directly to the conclusion. Yeah, maybe you yes. can jump to the conclusion and then we can ask some questions. We have yes. already some questions. Okay, now I need to uh, show my slide of conclusion again. Um, do you, do you see it? No, I don't see it yet. Yes. Okay. Yes, perfect. My, my conclusion, okay. I hope I have convinced you that the, the, the neutron scattering can help the polymer scientists to study the self-assembly of their, especially for block core polymers um, or conjugates or different types of, of polymers. And the, the scales that are studied are really in the nanometer range. Uh, also for the dynamics in the nanoseconds or picoseconds. Uh, so this is a very, uh, okay, it is very unfortunate that we, we have lost our national source in Saclay, but hopefully we will have new one in Lund, the ASS in, in several years. But, for the moment, we really need to train a new generation of, uh, of young polymer scientists. And uh, I give you here the website of all those um, institutions that so the, the French uh, Society of Neutron Scattering, the French Federation of Neutron, and uh, the facilities, so the ILL. Um, the ILL, this is where you can um, um, apply for beam time. So the proposal of writing is, is not very complicated. It's only two pages. You need to describe your system. You, you need to tell all the information that you have already from experiments in your lab. Like if you did uh, light scattering, uh, TEM. Uh, if you are a new user, you need to contact the local contacts, like th those people I, I told you about. They will help you. And um, and uh, most of the I mean, if your topic is interesting, then the committee will select, and you can you can um, make an experiment for one or few days. Uh, you can check out also the the website of this European League. Uh, okay, and I think <laughs> uh, I haven't told you about the the three dimensional hydrogens. Uh, okay, it's an, just another story, but I already talked too much and uh, <laughs> I would be to, to answer so to two questions that you might have. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, Olivier. Um, 
So if you have any questions, so you can also open your mic. I ah. have a question. Yeah, Pierre. Uh, thank you, Olivier, for your very illustrated uh, presentation. I have a, a very basic question. If I, I read a publication where, where there is a, a neutron uh, scattering uh, so curve, uh, what I have to look uh, in the curve to uh, make my own uh, opinion of uh, their analysis and have some, uh, some uh, ideas of uh, what they, they observed. Okay, very, very good point. Um, it, it is not uh, obliged that the curves are well fitted because as you know, you can always fit a curve with a multi-parameter model and what is important is that the model you use has a physical meaning. So um, usually the, the colleagues, they, will, they would use the SAS view, so the program I told you about, and they will uh, uh, represent their, their particle like geometrical shapes. And, but it really need to be, the parameter that you obtained, they need to be uh, physically uh, Soundful. <laughs> so be careful. Sometimes um, there are even in very uh, high impact factor journals, uh, there is a joke among uh, neutron scientists. There is a famous paper where they have a curve that is Q minus seven. And I told you that this envelope of the scaling law, I mean, it has to be between one and four, but you cannot have uh, an exponent above four. So even in a great journal like Nature Material, you can have a, a, a fit that is not physical. Does that, does that answer to your question, Pierre? Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand about the fit, but without a, a fit, uh, just uh, by looking the curve, uh, what, can, uh, um, what, what uh, do we have to observe to have uh, an opinion of uh, is the uh, it's great or what is uh, what was observed so one one other indication is the low q region um, what we call that the guinea regime this is where we measure the radius of generation of the shapes and usually if you have uh, nanoparticles that are well dispersed so that are not aggregating you should have a plateau it is not the case with ELP. If you remember the curve, I can show you them again. They, they were low Q increase. This is typical of interaction. And um, so I would say that, except if you have a macroscopic gel where it is, I can, I can show you on, um, I, I'm sorry, I need to show you again. The, the, but if you, if you have macroscopic gel, it's uh, total, or oh, I cannot. Maybe I need to go directly, directly to. Um, uh, if you go to a gel, it's normal to have. So you see for uh, an object here, you have the, the, the plateau. This is typical of individual uh, nano object. Do you see my screen or, or not? I'm not sure. No. Oh, you don't see. Sorry for that. Um, I need to share again. Uh, let's, I, I, I try to show you the, um, the curve for, Um, okay, for example, that one. Um, partage. Um, oh, I, I, I cannot manage again, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know why I cannot. Uh, sorry for that. I'm looking for the share screen. 
it's okay. We have uh, your screen here. You have it? Okay. So typically, okay, you have, this is for a micro gel. Okay, this, this one, you have different scales. And um, here you see you have a plateau. So this is a micro gel. In the case when you have a macroscopic particle, then you see the intensity is already very high, but it will continue to, to grow. So if the author of the paper claimed to have individual nanoparticles, they should have a plateau at the low Q. For particles which are below 100 nanometer, of course, if you have particles which are maybe 500 nanometer, then you really need to go to a very low Q spectrometer like the 11 to see the plateau. But uh, th this would be an uh, indication, I think, of uh, having a, I mean, well dispersed particle to, to look at the low Q region. <laughs> this would be my advice. Um, so there is uh, two questions on YouTube and one on Zoom. Maybe we can start with the YouTube question, if you're okay. Okay. Uh, first question is, uh, what about the advantage of SANS versus uh, SACS? Um, they are complementary. Um, with spoilers, you can do both. It depends on the contrast. Um, because for SACS, with polymers, you need, uh, I think, a large, either, if you, if you go to a SACS in your lab, uh, you, 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 you would need concentration, um, I would say, of 50 milligrams per milliliter at least, or even 100, so very large concentration. But if you go to the synchrotron, of course, you can use lower concentration. But Unlike neutron, the X-ray, you cannot change the contrast. Um, you, 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 you cannot uh, adjust the contrast with the solvent. So really, the neutron, the advantage is to be able to, be able to vary the contrast. And if you have a multi-component system, you can highlight different parts of your system. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question was, um, uh, when you are doing the substitution by deuterium for your sensor analysis, um, uh, is it necessary for all the polymer samples and uh, does it also, also, does it affect the critical temperature, temperature the LCST in your system like ELP? Uh, it's it's a good point. It is well known that, uh, as I told you, deuteration doesn't change the volume of the molecule, but it slightly changed the pKa value and also the LCST. I, I think, for example, uh, polynipam, you know, it's very well known. It has an LCST of 32 degrees. I think if it is deuterated, the LCST is affected maybe by two degrees. I, I don't remember in which uh, direction, but you can have a slight uh, variation of the uh, physical chemical uh, property like a transition temperature. That's, tr that's true. Okay. Um, so on Zoom, did you see the question on Zoom? I can read it or you can read it uh, on it's okay, on slide 37. So did you check if the nano object of ELP based copolymers change of change morphology with the temperature and concentration? It was 37. Okay. 37, okay. yeah. Maybe you can go to this slide. We are seeing okay. your slide at the moment. This one? Just yeah, so this, this was uh, measurements uh, done by, by Ye. So um, the question was exactly... Uh, do you observe change in morphology with temperature and concentration? Okay, so the, the change 
of the cloud point versus concentration is normal. It is, uh, it is the same for NIPAM, for example. Um, when for NIPAM, we say LCST is 32, but actually the cloud point is the transition temperature for, for the given concentration. And what happens usually is that you, you decrease this transition temperature uh, and then the minimum value is the LCST. This is by the lowest consolute transition or critical solute transition temperature. Um, for, for the morphology, this is, I mean, in this case with the dextran, we, we did not do too many different temperatures. We just measure above the TT, but it, it was the previous, um, my previous talk here, where um, what we show is that um, above the CMT, the micelles, they get still changed. They continue to, what, what happens is that the core gets drier and drier. The, the number, the fraction of water molecule gets smaller. So this is the type of morphology we can uh, assess. I mean, it's still the, the, the same size, but the, the core of the micelles get drier and drier. This is what we can get from, from the natron. I don't know if it answers the, the question correctly. I, I, I uh, it was my, my, my question, Olivier Khalid Fersi. Okay. I, <laughs> because I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> because I, um, I asked this question because of, I think, less than one year now, Stephen Arms talked about change morphology with temperature for HCC and UCST components. So for that, I asked you if you. Okay. We did some some advanced constant uh, advanced um, uh, characterization using um, balance or team to observe if uh, it could be. Also. I don't know how Steve explains, but imagine that you have a, a dye block and that the hydrophilic block gets more and more dehydrated. Mm. So you can with temperature. So then you can imagine that the hydrophilic to hydrophobic ratio change, and then you can have a morphology from uh, cylinders to, to vesicles, for example. Mm -hmm. This is what still I have found. Yeah. I explained this with plasticity of uh, core. Okay. Of, uh, non -object. So maybe it's a special copolymer, you know, but... Uh, it... Yeah, yeah, but uh, mm. is he doing neutron, Steve, or are you... Yeah, uh, Sachs. Sachs, okay. Sachs, yes. Okay, thank you, Olivier. And for the second question, you you by you already I asked just if you go for a high concentration of ELP uh, copolymers to observe this increase of uh, cloud bond to determine the LCST of your copolymer. Uh, I think there is a max. As you as you know, uh, Halid, the, the, those LP are quite uh, not expensive, but they. They cannot produce um, more than 100 milligrams. So I think there is a li an upper limit of concentration. But okay. uh, I know that Bertrand is studying uh, now uh, uh, more the material properties, so making like gels of ELP. So I think he, he, he will study this high concentration uh, regime. He's currently studying it. Okay. Thank you for the uh, very nice talk. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Okay. Is there any other question? I have I have one one very naive question because I don't know very much about neutrons. So you spoke a lot about sans and okay you explained the difference between sans and sacs, but uh, is there also some wide angle analysis? Uh, of course, of course uh, you, um, you have neutron diffraction. Of course. I did not uh, but to study the inorganic materials or to study the crystals, uh, usually with with science we go um, up to zero point five angstrom minus one. Yeah. You can you can do uh, a bit larger, but if you want to study above one angstrom minus one, you go to a diffractometer. 
Okay. Um, but, but the, for example, I think D33, you can do, you can measure simultaneously the low angle and the large angle. This is one of the uh, characteristics of the D33 spectrometer at high level. You can imagine to study semi-crystalline polymers, for example. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Uh, so if there is no more questions, so maybe we can close the station. So thanks again, Olivier. Thank you, everyone. It was a, a great experience. I learned a lot about neutrons. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Take care of you. Bye. Take care.